Welcome home to Unity. I'm Barb Buchanan, licensed Unity leader, leader and also a prayer chaplain. Unity is a positive path for spiritual living. We gather to create an experience of spirit. At Unity CR, we offer practical teachings that empower abund abundant and meaningful living. Meeting you right where you are, we endeavor to provide a variety of ways to support your path of spiritual living. And while you're all getting seated, uh, I invite you that before you shut off your phones for the service, I invite you to check in with us on Facebook for your status update. We appreciate you helping us create a presence in the community, community and sparking interest for those who may not know about us. And we also appreciate those who are live streamers today. So on your narrow sheet is our spirit activities. And uh, today we have a spiritual care team meeting. Uh, and that's going to be in the strong room. Also today in the sanctuary uh, is a talent showcase and tailgate meeting. Uh, all are welcome. So you could just stay seated and be here for the meeting. We also have on the 10th, a lending library, bookstore, and AM coffee team meeting at 9 a.m. in the sacred grounds. So if that sparks your interest or you have a passion leaning that way, uh, join that team on April 10th. And Susan Liddell and Jen Griffith wherever they might be. Uh, they are starting a book discussion on Byron Katie's Loving What Is. This is in the bookstore for $16. It is a marvelous book. Uh, and so there is a sign up in the foyer. They would like you to sign up so they know how many people are coming, handouts, paper things. So if this interests you, uh, look in the foyer. Susan and Jan are in the back raising their hands. And also, Martha Creek will be coming here in May. And she will be doing probably a workshop on this book on that Sunday forthcoming. We'll announce the May dates for sure. Vernon and Audrey will be in the prayer room today. So if you have a prayer you would like to have prayed with, they will be available for that with you. All right. Oh, one more. Oh, two more things. April is Love Month. And there are affirmation cards out in the foyer. Love is the ability to attract, unify, and desire. Our beloved Terry Benish, her service uh, visitation actually will be this coming Friday from 12.30 to 2.30 at Murdoch Linwood Funeral Home in Center Point. And following that uh, 2.30 time, there will be a grayside service immediately following. Our invocation is on the right-hand side of the bulletin, and I invite you to join me with saying that. It starts with, there is. There is only one presence and one power in my life and in the universe, God, the good, omnipotent. I invite you into prayer. into this time of stillness, into this time of 
Go into your heart space. Letting your thoughts come to that peaceful place of knowing. That the thought before is not there and the one coming, we are only in the present moment. We are in the present moment of the energy of spirit. That our energies combine with the universe to express that love, that peace, that joy. For we know that our thoughts are prayers. The Sanskrit meaning of prayer translates into seeing oneself as wondrously made. And indeed, We are wondrously made. We invite into our hearts those that we pray for today. We pass pass our blessings to those on our right and to those on our left. And we also pass our prayerful blessing to those behind us and to those in front of us. We are grateful for the planet Earth that sustains us. And we are ever mindful in this month of Earth Day to be mindful of how we show up. So for this gratitude of prayer, we indeed are blessed as we bless those around us. And so it is. Amen. Thank you. The daily word for today is the silence. In the silence, I find comfort. Deep beneath the random and shifting ways of my mind, I discover a vast ocean of peace. Like an ocean's choppy surface, my outer mind may seem busy and even stormy. As I stop and let my awareness turn within, I find a still, quiet place. In this moment, I take a deep cleansing breath and allow my muscles to relax. I still my mind and rest in the realization that I am divinely protected. In the silence of my being, I find comfort and serenity. Whatever appears to be going on at the surface of my mind, I can turn within and experience this peace. I take a moment now and rest in this sweet place of tranquility. In the silence, I find comfort from Isaiah 30, 15. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. And we'll have, with our youth ministry, information.
Hello, um, we're working on the power of um, compassion and one of the things that we're um, working on is developing empathy and we're discussing forgiveness and how we treat each other and that forgiveness is a choice. We're dealing with and how we care for our earth as well. So we're doing a lot of exciting things. We're reading Scrumpheus, and we created our seed bombs. And we have, um, of course, celebrated Easter. But this week, we're working on specifically forgiveness, and we have been blessed with a wonderful guest reader. Penelope is going to be reading a special book. It's called Do Unto Otters. <laughs> and um, she has all kinds of wonderful voices that she's going to be sharing with the children and that's really exciting and then we have some other um, wonderful things to do as well so I want to thank Penelope I want to thank Tia I want to thank Jody of course our lovely Jean and we will um, be enjoying ourselves and thank you for all the support of our youth development and we will be doing I was thinking we're forgiving in the light can we forgive in the light? I think we can. I think you can forgive anywhere because it's a choice, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're Thank forgiving you. in the light, in the light, in the light. We're forgiving in the light, in the light of God. In the light, in the light, in the light, in the light. In the light, in the light, in the light, in the light of God. We have such lovelies in this ministry, don't we? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just feel like we got off on the wrong foot, Joel. How did it feel for you? Joel walked all the way up from North Carolina to be with us. Welcome home, my friend. We have so many folks here this morning that um, knocked me over when I saw them. We have Dave and Sue Peters from Clinton, Iowa. We have my friend John from Unity Village Chapel and his grandson from here in Cedar Rapids. And who else did I see? I won't call out other people. We have Cindy. Cindy's here. Morning, Cindy. <laughs> I, a running joke. Cindy teaches yoga classes, and the one that I go to is at Prairie Woods on Thursday mornings. She thinks it starts at 9.30. I think it starts at 9.45. And so I was saying that after the class one day, and Cindy put her arm around me and said, yeah, yeah, Brenda thinks unity starts at 10. I think it starts at 10.15. So it works for both of us. Um, that song was so perfect this morning. Many of you know that this weekend, from Friday night at 6 until Saturday evening at 6, we had a 24-hour, uh, that would be 24 hours, wouldn't it? Department of Redundancy Department. We had a silent pray-in in, in our uh, chapel. It's the brainchild of Kyle Wilhelm, who had our first pray-in this past year, and bless his heart, we did 24 hours together in the silence and um, left last night, I don't know, it was between 6.30 and 7, and he and Lindsay are on the road this morning to Colorado for a short little trip. So we, we bless, bless him on that trip. It's really good for me to have an event that calls me to the silence. And this particular event has really given me quite a bit of pause for thought because when I first got started in the ministry uh, just a couple of years ago, I was very diligent about setting quarterly silent retreats for myself. And I would go away and, you know, be where there's not a phone and not a computer and uh, not a tablet and not a clock, and um, refill myself spiritually. I would do that once a quarter. And I'm really painfully aware that over the last three to four years that I have really let that slip from my platter. 
that experience in that chapel was very interesting. It, I said to um, Kyle when we finished and as we were picking things up, I said, you know, that was such a surreal experience. We had a, a table in there with the Christ candle in the center and 24 votives. And so every hour on the hour, we uh, rang the mindfulness bell and then Kyle would light another votive on the table. And it was just interesting, of course, in the first hour or two, you know, we have just a couple of candles glowing. And then as the night went on, pitch dark, we didn't have lights on in the building. We had luminaries leading from the doorway into the chapel. So it was just looking at the luminaries and watching the light grow hour by hour. And then at some point, I don't remember when, it felt like the hours were just slipping by. And I would hear Kyle lighting another candle, and I would strike the bell, and I would think that that was another hour. So it's interesting, this being in the silence. The other point is, <clears throat> yesterday was a very blustery day, Winnie the Pooh. And I said to Kyle, when we finished, I said, I fully expect to leave the building and walk out in the parking lot and find our, our entire roof in the parking lot because it just felt like the building was coming apart. So it was interesting being in that um, robust energy of nature and uh, listening to what the mind did with that and <laughs> wondering what parts of the building were would still be standing, ending up in Kansas looking for Toto, you know, that, that was a real possibility. So who among us has an actual spiritual practice of regularly being in the silence? Does anybody have that practice? What's that? Um, is it like a daily thing, a weekly thing, a monthly thing, whenever it happens thing? About an hour? Is it, did you say? I didn't hear what you said, Sally. I'm sorry. About 10 minutes, 5 minutes, couple minutes, 15 to 30 minutes daily? Never did that before. And now you're doing about 15 to 30 minutes a day of just being in the silence. Wow. You would re highly, highly recommend it. Um, Marty, daily, regularly, periodically, whenever? Okay. Okay. Five or ten minutes? That's a lot. Especially if you haven't practiced it at all. Five or ten minutes is a lot. I notice when I attend different unities, you know, every minister does the meditation differently. Um, some people talk all the way through the meditation, and some people don't talk at all, and some people just have these very long periods of silence. And I've heard comments about, you know, our silence is too long, our silence isn't long enough, and not just in this ministry, but, but all around. So it's just interesting to notice, <clears throat> excuse me, our comfort level with being quiet, with being quiet. It's very surreal. It's challenging. Was it challenging at first for you, Sally, when you started your practice? Um, what's it like not to speak for a period of time? It's good. So it makes some people really, really crazy. I was talking to my um, chiropractor last week about the pray-in coming up, and she goes, so nobody talks for 24 hours? And she said, well, how do you do that? For some people, it's, it's really nerve-wracking and really touchy. I remember my very first silent retreat. I don't remember if it was three, four, five days, something like that. 
And I realized in the first couple of days that I was talking to myself out loud. And at first I, you know, was kind of chastising myself about this was supposed to be a silent retreat and we're all, we're all supposed to be quiet here. And then I realized, you know, I'll just pay attention to my self-talk. Anybody ever tried that experiment? <laughs> Apparently you have. <laughs> so very interesting what comes up. Oh, I don't know. I heard it coming out of my mind. <laughs> so it is interesting to see what comes up. And it gets even richer when we can listen to our self-talk without any judgment or without wronging ourselves. When we can listen to our self-talk in a baggage-free way, we start to notice our tone, the tone that we take with ourselves. And we start to notice our maybe not so thoughtful or mindful self-condemnation. Awareness, you've heard me say this a time or two, awareness, what is it, Jean? I'm not catching your hand signal. You can just tell me, what is it? My muffler. That's all you had to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> awareness is 90% of the journey, is it not? Awareness is our first step to transforming old thought habits. So here's another thing about being in the silence. What does the body do when we stop perpetual motion? It what? Mine lights up. Your, yours lights up? Yeah. Lightens. Lightens. When you reach the groove. The groove you, does your body struggle with being still? Oh, I get real Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, Paul Hesselbeck, who uh, taught metaphysics at Unity, used to talk about, you know, how people talk about getting in a certain position. And he said, if God communicates with me when I'm in one position and one position only, I don't want that kind of God. You know, so, but allowing the body to be still can be very important in the stillness. And for some of us, when, when we go to that mode of being still, it's like somebody found the fidget button and it just all goes off. That's, um, I've said this before, my mother um, used to say to me, and I apologize in advance for the recording, um, my mother used to say to me, sit still, you're like a fart in a skillet. So sitting still has apparently never been a strong suit for me. And it's interesting to notice in mindful meditation, all of the mental impulses that occur when I'm inviting the body to stop the perpetual motion. On retreat, when I, when I do those several day silent retreats, I think, you know, I'll just sit here until the sun is down. Not so much skin off anybody's nose, just sit here. And so I get all comfortable, maybe 90 seconds, maybe a good two minutes. I think, you know, I think I'll get a piece of fruit. I'm kind of hungry for a cookie. Maybe I'll make a cup of tea. And then I turn to what uh, Reverend Robert Brummett taught us in Silent Retreat. Can I do this one more minute? Can I sit like this for one more minute? Can I be still for one more minute? I remember the first mindful meditation we did in his class 
and we made notes later about what went on in the meditation and man did I itch I have an itch by my eye Oh, well, now my shoulder itches now my ankle itches and he really encouraged us to to just be with that and I don't know if you know this but if you just be with an itch before I know it my shoulder and I haven't touched it it's no longer itching but now it's my ankle and then it's my knee and then it's my ear so I remember talking with him about it later and he said what is it you're itching to do and I said well I really have to sit with this question but primarily I'm itching to fidget so what does our mind do what does our mind do when there's no television no laptop no smartphone no tablet no book what does our mind do when we don't occupy it with something it fidgets every thought just parading and they don't necessarily connect these thoughts do they bill they don't necessarily connect our, our random yeah our random thoughts what does your mind do when you get into the stillness other thoughts what's what's the biggest challenge with it what Marty what what does your mind do oh as in like designing and creating whoa does anybody else have that experience how awesome I didn't even know that was possible <laughs> yes got to get through the chatter what Brummett taught us about that it, it for years I heard people in unity talk about meditation and I didn't get it because I thought I was the only one with a chattery mind and I didn't know how to not have a chattery mind and finally finally one of the very first classes I took at unity village for um, SEE was a course with Brummett on mindful meditation and what he taught us is we let the thoughts pass there's no thing to stop there's no thing to resist there's no thing to overcome and the visual that he gave us that stays with me is um, because I love trains when I grew up there was a train track right near our house and I loved the sound of the trains at night and that's the visual that he taught us it's like a train car passing by how many cars were in that train I don't know I just heard the rhythm I just heard the clickety clack and so we don't have to catch the thought we don't have to let it snag us we simply name it oh there's a thought there's a thought no attachment nothing to push against because I told myself for so many years like I shouldn't be thinking and Brummett said one day it's what the mind does it thinks what a relief I haven't been doing it wrong I simply haven't quote unquote gotten through it just stay with it because after a while the mind is still doing its thinking the train is still going down the track and I have gone far far away especially when Carl Swanson is leading a meditation I hear about the first probably sentence and a half two sentences of whatever he's taking us into and then in the very next second he's saying and we come back to and I'm like I must have missed a lot of paragraphs there but of course we didn't miss a thing because we were in the silence like any trained member of society 
I am very well trained to keep my mind busy and occupied and active about 90% of my waking hours. And so when we first get quiet, the mental mania committee clamors to the front, wants lots of attention, and all we have to do is let it go by. You know, um, the other day I mentioned to a congregant that we'd be talking about the silence today, and what's so hard about that? He didn't skip a beat, and he said, fear of emptiness. And that thought snagged my mind like a fish on a hook. Fear of emptiness. Is that what the silence is about? Is that what the stillness is about? Are we afraid of the empty? You know, for me, it's not a chock full agenda that causes anxiety or stress. It's checking my calendar on a day off and there's nothing on my schedule. And my mind starts racing. What can I do today? What do I need to accomplish? What do I need to get done? What do I need to achieve? A lot of you know that in February, I went on a month-long sabbatical thank you, God, with uh, my very best minister buddy. And I do have to say that um, sabbaticals are vital for a minister's health because in this job, the spiritual and mental and emotional outpour is continual, it's constant. And I am blessed to be in a ministry that supports sabbatical and support spiritual well-being. So before we left on our um, trip, we made an agreement that we would have no schedule. For 30, well, Aaron kept pointing out, we picked the shortest month of the year because we went in February. <laughs> but wasn't it leap year? Didn't we get one extra day? <laughs> so funny. We picked the shortest month of the year. So almost 30 days of no schedule. And it took about two weeks to let myself rest. Interesting to know, had it been a two-week trip, would it have taken one week to let myself rest? Had it been a two-month sabbatical, would it have taken one month to let myself rest? You know, it's like Jesus getting in the boat and floating away. All of us need to step out of our life roles, our life roles, to fill our spiritual tank. Now, we don't always have the luxury of a month to do this sort of thing, but we still carve out, some of us still carve out, our sabbatical time, our Sabbath time. It really, truly can be 10 minutes a day. It can be an hour a day. It can be an hour a week. It could be a weekend. Or you could set a periodic time, like three or four days a quarter, and run those together. I truly invite all of us into this intention of creating a spiritual practice. Fear of emptiness. Does that strike a nerve with any of us? Is that what might keep us from being in the silence? Yes? No? The empty isn't so empty. Have we become so accustomed to having our minds and our bodies occupied that this thought of turning to the silence makes us just want to turn and run. And for those of us who have practiced the silence, we know that the benefits are men me. Study after study supports the physical health benefits and the mental health benefits and the spiritual benefits. And overall, our serenity is greatly enhanced and our ability to be fully present 
is greatly enhanced. What do classic Unity teachers say about the silence? Have you read much about that? Anybody know the name May Rowland? You do, John, right? May Rowland? She um, knew a little bit something about the silence because she succeeded Unity co-founder Myrtle Fillmore as the director of Silent Unity. And she started in 1916 and held that position until 1971, a mere 55 years. And in her book, The Magic of the Word, May wrote, it may take years to learn to enter the silence, but we have to begin. We have to begin. We have to take time every day to be still. So making this practice, this intention, a part of our lives is like starting an exercise program. It's like strengthening our spiritual muscles. And Roland also wrote, silence, the inner realization of God's presence, has to be practiced. Right, Kevin? It's, it is a practice. It's a spiritual practice. And so she urges us to keep practicing. And finally, she said, the silence is not something mysterious. It is the inner place of stillness where you feel and know your oneness with God. You know, our story may be that the silence is deafening. It may be that the emptiness is frightening. And the reality is that silence is not at all empty. It is filled with the allness of spirit. I don't believe that it's the silence that's deafening. I believe that it's the noise with which we surround ourselves that deafens us to the sound of silence. Co-founder Charles Fillmore wrote uh, this talk on truth called Reform Your God Thought. He says, all power has its birth in the silence. There is no exception to this rule in all the evidence of life. Noise is the dying vibration of a spent force. All the clatter of visibility from the harangue of the politician to the thunder's roar is but evidence of exhausted power. And in her book, Effectual Prayer, we have these books in our um, sacred grounds. In her books, Effectual Prayer, Fan Francis Folk wrote this. Spiritual deafness will cease when we really cross the threshold into the silence. For the inner ear will become alert in seeking to catch the message of the still small voice. Many a message will come to us when we have become still enough to enter the silence. As we settle in for meditation this morning, I want to close with some words from the great James Dillett Freeman. Um, he also knew a little bit about the silence. He followed May Rowland as director of Silent Unity. And uh, he served there from 1971 until 1984. And before I go into these words, I want to mention that in your program is a small purple prayer slip. So at any time during um, the reading and during the silence, if you have a prayer and intention that you would like to share with the universe, I invite you uh, to write the name of who it's for and either choose what's on the list or write in your own. And you may silently bring it forward and deposit it in our prayer box. So you can do that at any time during the meditation. 
Many of us are familiar with James Dillett Freeman, quite the prolific writer. So I invite you to get comfortable with these words. There are many kinds of silence. There is the drowsy silence of the noonday fields. There's the restless silence of the sleeping city. There is the silence of grief too deep for words. The silence of joy too full for laughter. The movement of the heavens and the growth of living things are silent. There's the silence of human thought. But deeper is the silence of the place of peace within you. Deeper is the silence where you commune with God. In the silence is strength for the tired body. In the silence is light for the joyless mind. In the silence is love for the lonely spirit. In the silence is peace for the troubled heart. There, the whole being becomes a place of prayer, a holy temple set on a hill. There, you know God as a living presence. The silence is a holy place, a place of stillness and peace. It is not far away. It is right where you are now. It is right where you are whenever you shut the doors of your senses, still the importuning of your thoughts, and turn to God. When you enter, the world outside melts away. And when you leave, your body and mind are stilled, refreshed, and restored. He wrote a beautiful poem called I Am There. Do you need me? I am there. You cannot see me, yet I am the light you see by. You cannot hear me, yet I speak through your voice. You cannot feel me, yet I am the power at work in your hands. I am at work, though you do not understand my ways. I am at work, though you do not recognize my works. I am not strange visions. I am not mysteries. Only in absolute stillness beyond self can you know me as I am, and then but as a feeling and a faith. Yet, I am there, I hear, I answer. When you need me, I am there. Even if you deny me, I am there. When you feel most alone, I am there. In your fears, I am there. In your pain, I am there. I am there when you pray and when you do not. I am in you and you are in me. Only in your mind can you feel separate from me. For only in your mind are the mists of yours and mine. Yet only with your mind can you know me and experience me? Empty your heart of empty fears. When you get yourself out of the way, 
I am there. You of yourself can do nothing, but I can do all. I am in all. Though you may not see the good, good is there, for I am there. Only in me does the world have meaning. Only out of me does the world take form. Only because of me does the world go forward. I am the law on which the movement of the stars and the growth of living cells are founded. I am the love that is the law's fulfilling. I am assurance. I am peace. I am oneness. I am the love that you can cling to. I am your assurance, your peace. I am one with you. I am. Though you fail to find me, I do not fail you. Though your faith in me is unsure, my faith in you never wavers because I know you, because I love you. Beloved, I am there. And so it is. And so we fully trust that it is so. Amen. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, we have several of these booklets. I put most of them in the Sacred Grounds and Books, so feel free to take one with you if you like. There's all sorts of inspirational readings in here about silent prayer. <laughs> Funny that silent prayer takes so many words, isn't it? And also, all the books from which I quoted are in our newly coming together lending library. Effectual Prayer is a great book on prayer. Now comes the time when we bless 
our tithes and offerings. And we give thanks for those who participate in our energetic ether mode of auto tithe. And for those of us who um, may do both or give physically, we invite you to take your gift in your hand. We know in unity that that which we bless appreciates. And the blessing is found in the bulletin. It begins with the words divine love. I invite you to know it with me. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I am so grateful. 